Hey everybody, welcome to Rationable Interviews. Today we are going to be busting some conspiracy theories, checking out some aliens and UFOs. And for that, I've got on board Mick West. He is a conspiracy theory debunker or skeptic. I'll let Mick clarify that. He's got a couple of websites. One of them is Metabunk, which I've also visited. And he's got books on conspiracy theories and how to talk to conspiracy theorists. One of them is Escaping the Rabbit Hole, which I did read a couple of years ago. And it was fantastic. Very, very easy to read and lots of very good advice. And all about talking to people in a very nice, reasonable way rational way, which is what we do here at Rationable, because that's what the name suggests. Mick, welcome on. Thank you. And just real quick, I only have one book out Ooh. so far. I just escaping the rabbit hole. Oh, really? Uh, I have other things like like podcasts and things like that, but uh, just the one book so far. Second edition will be coming out this summer. And after that, I'm going to write a book on UFOs. So I will at some point have more than one book, but, uh, but for now, just the one. All right. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to those. So what exactly, if you could just give us a little bit of an overview of what are the things that, what are the projects that you're involved in these days? What are the things you do in life in general? What were, I think you were a gaming programmer at one point of time. Yeah. yeah, I was a video game programmer and I worked on the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater video games like a long time ago, which you know, some people might be familiar with. And after that, I kind of took up writing and just writing like you know, magazine articles and web posts and things like that, and eventually my book. But I got really interested in investigating conspiracy theories. And one of the first ones I looked at was a thing called chemtrails, which is the belief that the government is spraying things from the backs of planes. You see these planes leaving trails in the sky, yeah, which are just contrails. It's the condensation from the engine exhaust. Exactly. And people think that it's some kind of mysterious spraying thing. And that kind of led to other things. I started investigating, say, 9-11 conspiracy theories like the World Trade Center destruction. People who claim that these mass shootings in the United States are faked and things like fraud and even things like flat earth. There are people, some people who believe or claim to believe in the flat earth theory that the earth isn't a globe, but it's actually flat. And it's, it's kind of a continuum of various different conspiracy theories. But most recently, I've been interested in UFOs. And partly the reason for that is that it's become more popular in the news. So you, you read lots about it. But I also personally just really enjoy the challenge and the, of the puzzle of trying mm -hmm. to figure out what we're seeing in, say, a UFO video. So I just enjoy doing the mathematics to analyze that and hopefully figure out what's going on. Wonderful. We'll definitely get into that in a bit. But first, one of the first encounters I had with conspiracy theories, etc., was when I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was telling me about chemtrails. And I, I, I honestly hadn't heard of them before. So not only was I skeptical, I was also a little surprised that this was a thing, that this was an actual conspiracy theory that was going around. So I had an extremely long conversation where we finally, unfortunately, it didn't end well, but <laughs> but I did try to keep my cool as much as possible through the entire thing. One of the things was, I he did share a video of actually a website of geoengineering. So geoengineering is actually a thing, apparently. But and there, I've seen a couple of papers about it of where the idea of spraying different chemicals into the extremely high atmosphere would be able to reflect yeah. enough sunlight to cool down the earth. But have people actually done that to any extent? Has it, any of that actually proved no. itself? No, I mean, we say it's a thing, but it's a thing in the way that you know, interstellar travel is a thing. It's something that's uh, technically possible and certainly within our capabilities, but it's not something we've actually done yet. Or I guess a better example would perhaps be bases on the moon. We know that bases on the moon is something that will probably happen in the future. And there probably will be people living on the moon in houses on the moon at some point in the future. And there's patents for houses on the moon and things like that. So it's one of those things that's technically possible and people talk about it, but it's not actually being done. 
Most recently, I think the, it was in the news for, I believe it was the government of some country in South America. I can't remember where it was, like maybe Venezuela or someone like that. But they banned geoengineering. And the reason they banned it was that someone was doing tests down there. Now, by tests, that sounds kind of dramatic, like we're trying to block out the sun. All these tests were, were, were releasing about five pounds of fine dust or sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere and s just seeing how easy it is to spray it out of a nozzle, seeing how quickly it dissipates. And if you compare that to the millions and millions of tons of industrial emissions, and the uh, billions of tons of emissions from volcanoes, essentially, it's essentially a drop in the ocean. I mean, literally, it's that order of magnitude. Thanks. Put a bit of ink in the ocean, it doesn't make the ocean turn black. It, it, nothing actually happens. So it's something that we may actually do in the future. You know, mm -hmm. Humanity as a whole, because if you do it, it affects the entire planet, may actually do some type of geoengineering to block the sun in the future. But it's not being done right now. And you know, I've talked to people who do research in this field and they all say how ridiculous it is that the idea that it's being done because we don't even know if it will work and we don't know what the side effects are. So yeah, exactly. uh, the idea that we're doing it secretly is very ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And even if, they, even if we did do it, I think there'd be a, a great quantity of whatever material we've sprayed into the atmosphere we're gonna go, is going to come down on us. And we're going to be ending up breathing it, dusting it off our shelves. But also, that's the same problem that I saw with chemtrails. Because if you're spraying huge amounts of chemicals into the air, even at 30, 40,000 feet, or maybe even a little bit higher, that's going to rain down on all of us. How is I didn't really understand yeah. how it really affect us all, especially if there are people who are trying to keep us subjugated and I guess easy to open to like what is it so just keep us sleeping yeah yeah i think like you would think it, it would come down but when you actually kind of consider what it would take you probably wouldn't really notice it there was a famous volcanic eruption called pinatubo i believe it was in the 90s and this basically lifted enough material up into the stratosphere that it did actually change the weather of the entire planet for a few years afterwards. It cooled down the planet. And oh. that's essentially nature doing a little bit of geoengineering. <laughs> and we didn't notice dust falling on, on our cars then. Maybe there was a little bit more dust than normal, but dust in the air anyway. And There's nothing not called method. mineral dust. It's just basically dirt. When the wind blows th things, it lifts dirt into the air. There's also a lot of salt particles in the air because of the salt that uh, gets kind of whisked up from the surface of the ocean. Very small droplets get whisked up and then evaporate and the salt particles end up in the air. And there's lots of particulates from uh, industrial em emissions, as well as some a little bit from plane exhaust. So there's a lot of stuff in the air already that we wouldn't really notice if they were doing geoengineering. So it's not really a good argument to use against it. Of course, yeah, it's something yeah. that... that they could use, they could actually say like, oh, well, maybe they're doing it in secret, but if it's doing it in secret, how do you know they're doing it? There's actually no evidence that it's being done. Yeah. And well, especially in Delhi, because we've got so much pollution right. is plus, I mean, Northern India in this area is kind of like a scrub desert. So yeah, we've got a lot of- but You get the dust in there. <laughs> Have you ever been convinced by any of the uh, the evidence that you've seen at least for chemtrails let's start there but well no because any the, the main piece of evidence now the main piece of evidence that people give for chemtrails is that they see these strange looking trails mm. which they think are difficult to explain and what they are they're they're contrails and there's a number of reasons why people end up thinking that they're strange some people think that contrails shouldn't persist and the reason they think is that they think that it's actually condensation in the same way when you breathe out on a cold day, and it's cold winter's day and you breathe out, you see condensation on your breath, yeah. but it doesn't form a cloud in front of you. It doesn't form a trail mm -hmm. and it will ev evaporate. It dissipates. Mm -hmm. It's actually, technically, I think it sublimates, but it's, uh, it, it disappears. And But the difference is with a contrail is that contrails form in the upper atmosphere where it's very cold. It's like minus 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. which, uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. Fun fact, minus 40 degrees is the same in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. Finally. the scales inter intersect. <laughs> so if you don't want to use either one, you can just always just only use minus 40 as your, your temperature for everything. 
But yeah, so at minus 40, water freezes instantly and water droplets in the air will just homogeneously freeze, which means they don't need a nucleus. Either they don't need a little particle to freeze around. The water particles in the air can be super cooled at temperatures above that, which means you can get clouds of water that are below freezing, but don't actually freeze. But at below minus 40, they will always freeze into ice. So that means that the contrail will persist because it's frozen into ice. So it can't so readily evaporate because it's a lot harder for ice to evaporate than it is for water to evaporate, obviously. Yeah. It's a different type of process, physical process. And at minus 40, it's not going to melt. So there's these kind of technical reasons behind explanations for what's actually going on. But the problem is because they're technical, it becomes very difficult to explain them to people. You know, if you talk about, I just said, homogeneous nucleation of <laughs> ice, it's, it's a concept that is difficult to convey to people. It's like in water below freezing, but it doesn't freeze. That doesn't make any sense. But these are like just basically simple physics things, but they're also things that are very difficult to convey. And that allows in the conspiracy theories. So yeah. I say, like, I don't find, personally find it difficult to explain these things, but I find it difficult to explain them to other people because it's difficult to convey even fairly simple physics concepts sometimes. Yeah, it is. And especially because, I mean, I learned about contrails when I was a kid and my parents taught me in a very uh, simple, straightforward manner. And it kind of stuck with me. But I think uh, there are a lot of people, especially in so many education systems across the world, these kinds of little everyday phenomena are usually glossed over for just memorizing large passages of whatever's in the textbook. And it's never really applied to real life in many cases. But yeah, well, I think with that, there's kind of an interesting phenomena in the, what you learn about contrails probably isn't like the actual pure root science, which is quite complicated. It's to do mm. with adiabatic mixing curves where things mix together at a constant pressure and the humidity and temperature varies. So you get a two-dimensional curve and then you've got regions of that, which which some parts of regions of the curve are in ice supersaturation. And if the one curve goes through the other one, then something happens. They don't teach you that at school. They just teach you that contrails are clouds that form behind planes. Contrails are the condensation from the jet engine. And because they don't actually teach you the real science, which is very complicated and be more advanced, it's easy to dismiss because you, we know that there's stuff behind all that stuff that they are saying. And you're kind of accepting the authority of your parents or your teachers when they tell you things like that, even though they're telling you things that are correct, you're not really doing investigations into contrails or doing experiments or anything like that. You're just accepting that it's condensation from the engines. It makes clouds. And so that also becomes very easy for the conspiracy theorist to say, well, but why? You know, and what's the actual physics here? And why don't they evaporate? And then you can't explain it because you haven't actually done the real physics. Yeah. But have you, what's your background, academic background? Did you do science in school and college or something of that sort? I just did computer science at school, but I, I've always been very interested in popular science. So I read a lot of science books. Ah. Uh, and in my job as, as a computer programmer for video games, you do a lot of physics, yeah, which is mostly to do with the physics of motion, but also to do with the physics of light when you're figuring out like the reflective properties of materials and things like that. And things like ray tracing and 3D coordinate geometry. So I have a kind of a, a good foundation on that type of thing. And then the other stuff is just is science and math and algebra, which obviously I know you know, basic yeah. uh, mathematics. And it's if you can follow that, then you can follow the science behind other things. And yeah, you, know, you learn a lot investigating conspiracy theories. That's if you actually kind of get into them, like especially something like like chemtrails, which is uh, related to a lot of scientific topics. There's like the physics of cloud formation, there's the physics of flight and how that relates to cloud formation. And then the chemical analysis. Like how do you analyze like a soil sample or an air sample or a water samples? And what do the results mean? What do the spectrography mean? Well, what are the errors that you can get with it? There's lots of interesting science. I almost feel like they should teach conspiracy theories at school because there's so much actual fun <laughs> science you can learn in it. Yeah, I mean, I, hey, that's another book idea for you. you the science yeah. of conspiracy theories. You can really do a... I'm sure it, it, it is, a, in fact, a, a book I'd considered writing at one point. But maybe the, maybe my, it'll be my third book. Because I honestly, my mathematics has always been kind of awful. I've been trying to improve it more recently now that because I have this love for science 
But fortunately, it's the mathematics part that I've always kind of failed at, literally and figuratively. <laughs> but yeah, you don't need uh, too much, I think. That this it's almost like there's like a basic set of tools that you need if you're going to be an investigator. Yeah. Which I mean, you do need basic algebra. Uh, so you do, you do need to be able to do that, and you often need basic trigonometry, which is just you know the, uh, just triangles basically. I mean, it's not you don't need anything super complicated. You don't need calculus. You almost never need to use calculus. I mean, I don't, but that's probably because I've forgotten most of it. But I've never found it necessary <laughs> to, to use calculus. It's a pretty rare thing. And if you, you can, should... someone's usually done it for you already. But I, you should definitely write about this. This should be. I would definitely pick yeah. it up because. I have to brush up on a lot of this stuff. And every time I'm researching a new topic, I'm always kind of going into this and trying to, I have to refresh my high school science from scratch pretty much and put things together. It comes from statistics and other forms of research and how to figure out P values and stuff like that, which is something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But But again, uh, it's like the basics. It's like standard deviations and P values and and even just like the very basics, like figuring out the average and the mode and the median and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, this is certainly good to have a reasonable basis in science and a bit of mathematics to follow the topics and to be able to discuss them effectively. I remember the, a couple of years back, a few years ago, NVIDIA had come out with a new chip, wasn't it? Where they demonstrated the moon landing and being able to accurately yeah. uh, show the light that would have been falling and the reflections of light from all the surfaces and being able to recreate the whole moon landing in graphics in through the computer programming. That yeah, they- in real time. Yeah, that was quite fascinating. Yeah, they, some of the issues with the moon landing that people say are suspicious are the lighting. And you see, you know, that there's no atmosphere, so there's no scattering of light on the moon. And the light is always coming from one direction, and it's just the sun, obviously. And the light rays are all parallel. So we know that you know, any line from a point to a shadow will be parallel to any other line from a point to a shadow. And the light is only coming from one direction. So you would expect things to be lit well on one side, but not on the other. Like you would expect it to be like light, like very evenly lit here. But if I was to turn off one of my lights, I would be shaded because everything's coming from this side. But you would expect things to look like you. If you think of the moon, you look at the moon in the sky when it's like a half moon. Mm -hmm. It's bright white on one side and just black on the other side. And people kind of expected that on the surface of the moon because you're being brightly lit from one side. But... What they don't account for is that there's all the light being reflected off the surface of the moon. And essentially moonlight is then illuminating the other side. And that's why you have the light in the way it is. And then you also have issues with the shadows falling on uneven ground. And it makes them look like they're not exactly parallel. But if you actually model it correctly, it does actually work out. Of course, the average person can't boot up their video card and create a 3D model. So again, you have to kind of trust people. But You can demonstrate it. You can kind of rotate the model around and show it from different directions. And it's a pretty useful tool. Yeah, it was actually fascinating because a lot of people saying that with CGI and stuff like that, but back in the 60s, there was no CGI Mm -hmm. that did not exist at that point in time. And there's, I've received, I even got a video of what one person claimed was Steven Spielberg, oh, sorry, Kubrick, who was sitting there talking about- Yeah, Stanley Kubrick. The talking about making the moon landing film. And I was like, I watched the entire thing. And I was like, is that really Stanley Kubrick? Because it doesn't look like him. First of all, it's a bearded guy in the dark, badly lit. I don't know. I can't recognize his voice. It's not like I've ever, I've listened to a lot of Stanley Kubrick interviews. But I was like, this is just some, it looks like it could be, just some random bearded person sitting in a darkish room talking about this. How can I trust that person? But these kinds of conspiracy theories about the moon landing are so, so popular and so widespread that it's absolutely, it boggles the mind. Like I was in 2018, when I came to come to Vegas, I had gone to watch a movie, which is First Man. And there was a, I was at the counter, I was buying the ticket and there's this guy next to me and he said that, oh, which movie are you going to watch? I said, first man. He's like, what's it about? 
I said, the moon landing, the first man on the moon. He said, oh, you, do you really think that happened? <laughs> I said, yeah. I, I said, maybe you should come with me and we'll watch the movie together. <laughs> you should check this movie out. <laughs> it's got all the details about what yeah. NASA was up to at that point of time. And he was like, yeah, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. <laughs> so, but I, it, I, it makes me wonder, like, why would people, especially now, because back then people were absolutely astonished by the achievement. But as time has passed, the moon landing hoax conspiracy theory has yeah. gone. Why do you think that is? It's one of those things it's easy to create a collection of evidence for. And if you only create, if you kind of just cherry pick all the things that you think are suspicious, it's easy to make a compelling case. There's a, a, there's a variety of like YouTube videos, probably older ones on VHS, where people have done just that. And they, they say everything they find to be suspicious about the moon landing. And someone watching that with no frame of reference and no real ability to counter those arguments, it's very easy to get sucked in. They, so, they show you things like, here's the flag waving on the moon and there's no atmosphere on the moon. That proves that it's fake. And sure, yeah, you can come along and then explain what's going on there. But there's so many of these things yeah. that it seems to people like the weight of the evidence proves that it's fake. They'll say like the shadows are in the wrong direction. The moon lander looks like it's just made from tinfoil and there's too many good photographs. Uh, the tracks look wrong. Cars shouldn't be able to do that. You can't you see the like stars. You can see strings in this point. Yeah. yeah, you can't see the stars. Like the standard arguments that all have been answered literally decades ago come up again and again. And you get new generations. You get kids who didn't grow up knowing that anything about the moon landings and or knowing anything about the moon landing hoax and then they hear about it and it's in the context the wider context for them of like why should i trust the government and then they hear about these this moon landing hoax and they see a documentary and it, it looks compelling to them it's a fun interesting and easily believable theory if you're in that mindset and all you look at is this cherry-picked evidence but why but what is the best evidence that we should that should convince us that the moon landing did happen. Well, one of the best things is the video of it. The thing is, like the video of the moon landing is actually a continuous TV broadcast of that event, and there is actually no way of actually faking that using the technology of the time. The kind of a good YouTube video on that somewhere, but you would have to have an infinitely long spool of tape that and that cover this entire thing and record the entire thing in advance and then play it all back as things were happening. And at the same time, fake these broadcasts coming, these radio broadcasts coming from space and have all these different tracking stations around the world, like see, being able to like listen to the broadcasts and also see the rocket take off and then come back in exactly the right trajectory for going around the moon. And then lots of other things as well that, that, that prove it. Like there are actually, there's a laser reflector on the moon right now. And if you wanted to, you could actually make a laser that would be powerful enough to actually, I mean, they exist at universities and they bounce lasers off the moon to detect how far away the moon is and whether it's moving away from us or not, which it is. I think it's moving very slowly away from us. And you can test these things. And we send more spaceships to the moon now and they are able to see the lunar landing sites. You can take photographs of it. You can actually see the tracks of people in the ground, where the you know, footprints and the, the where the buggy went around. There's going to be a manned tourist flight to the moon in probably sometime in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, they, I think it's SpaceX is uh, doing it. Some Japanese guy has, has charted it already, and he's taking like 12 of his friends on a flight around the moon. So you know, these things are actually happening right now. We're we're verifying that space is real and the moon is real, and they can probably they'll probably arrange it so they can take photos of the lunar landing site. There's a vast amount of evidence. You, there's uh, I can't remember the website, but I think it's called something like like a it's a or something. I can't remember what it is, but you could probably look it up and put it in the, the show notes. Yeah. But a very good site that goes through all of these hoaxes and explains what the counter evidence actually is and I'm what the evidence is that shows that we actually went to the moon. There's a lot of it. All right. If you do figure out the link, send it over. I'll have a look at it and I'll check with you if I Yeah. And so that kind of, that brings me to the, uh, to the UFOs. Now there has been, there have been 
so many reports and they're continuing, like especially History Channel just kind of propagates that, yeah. that concept to no end. There was, of course, just recently I interviewed Dr. Andre Kostopoulos from the University of Alberta and I had him comment on the Netflix show, which was Ancient Apocalypse. And of course, mm. we have Ancient Aliens, which is the uh, the prevailing show. And I've been watching a bunch of stuff on that recently. It's very hard for me to kind of wrap my head around how any of that is convincing because most of it is just <laughs> conjecture. Like people are just saying like, this looks like it, this could be it. What if it could be? Especially like we even have the hollow earth hypothesis. I've I've loved X-Files since I was a kid. I used to watch that. Are you an X-Files fan? Not really. I never really watched the show. I kind of missed me, I think. <laughs> Oh. I've seen a few episodes. You should have. But I did. I did just go to Alien Con this weekend, which is the Ancient Aliens Convention. Oh, uh, really? Pasadena here. Yeah. So that was pretty interesting because I, I got to see a bunch of the people who are on TV mm-hmm. and the Ancient Aliens show and talk to a bunch of the fans there. And you could see that there's a wide variety of people who watch these shows. And some of the people who watch them... It's just for entertainment. They just find the idea very interesting. Other people, it's actually essentially a deeply spiritual event. They think that think of the aliens in a way as being a spiritual beings like angels or spirits from another dimension that are here to do good and elevate humanity to the next level. So you can kind of see it's not just simply people getting the wrong idea about archaeology. It's people having very specific ideas about the mystical nature of existence and their own existence and things like the afterlife and things like that. So it's almost like a religion rather than a misconception. Oh, that's very interesting. This is uh, this reminds me of the whole Heaven's Gate the cult, which they eventually committed suicide wearing the same matching Nike sneakers. I think this was in the 90s, right? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, very much. Much like that, because they see the Heaven's Gate people saw UFOs and aliens, but really almost like the UFO itself became the mystical messenger of God. And they see it as some kind of redeeming force in the universe, something that's going to come along and take them away. And that was what the Heaven's Gate people believed, that the UFOs were actually going to physically carry them away to another world. And that didn't end up happening. And so they figured out that they must have to leave their earthly bodies. And so they all unfortunately committed suicide, thinking that they were going to be, their souls would be swept up by the UFOs. Uh, Obviously, that's a super extreme case, and most people are nothing like that. But people do, I think, have this very hopeful idea about UFOs. They think that they are going to be somehow be what saves humanity. And also what elevates them individually. Because a lot of people are very unhappy with their lives and they think you know, they're in a hum- humdrum existence. And if aliens exist and the aliens come along, and maybe they can talk to the aliens. And a lot of them do things like go out into the desert and try to commune with aliens. They're, it can just basically elevate their life to the next level and elevate humanity to the next level. And so they, they're very hopeful and hence very willing to believe what people tell them. Yeah, I, it's, it is a very appealing idea. As I was talking with Dr. Kostopoulos, it's, I want to believe. There was a time when, I mean, I'm a huge science fiction fan. I've been watching and reading science fiction since I was 12 years old. So I've been, yeah. and I've watched the entire X-Files series from beginning to end. They used to, they had it airing in India as well. So, and in fact, when I was watching Cosmos by Carl Sagan, when I was a kid, which they also aired in India, the scenes that really stood out to me that have ingrained themselves in my mind from that time were the scenes where he was talking about alien abductions and uh, alien encounters. So like the mm-hmm. typical driving down a street and the car turns off and all the lights go out and there's a strange light in the sky and the radio starts flipping stations by itself And you see this light and it descends and then it disappears. And next thing you know, you've lost time and you've had all these. So you've, you don't know exactly where you are, but suddenly your car starts up by itself. 
I think though, the, those kinds of stories were included in Cosmos. I think he was just speculating about that at that point of time. I, he, of course, he didn't believe that we have actually been visited yeah. by UFOs. But that's what stuck in my mind. That's it's because the idea itself is so profound and so appealing. We all want it to be true, but we just are not thinking critically enough about the evidence that we see. We because we have that confirmation bias, we want to believe it. So therefore, any evidence that may suggest that it was that it's the case we kind of we just gobble it up like even the, yeah. the indiana jones installment of the crystal skull that was about the whole mayan crystal skulls and ancient astronauts etc that were <laughs> engraved or so so we thought but yeah it's just it is very appealing but why do you think uh, what is the best evidence that you, that you have seen for ufo's till date because a lot of stuff has been coming well, up. <laughs> there, there isn't really any great evidence. And that's the th thing about UFOs is that there's a, a vast amount of evidence, but mm. the evidence is all not very good. It's all bl blurry videos or it's videos that look fake or it's stories from people. And when I'm asked for what the best evidence is, it's, it's a bit of a struggle to actually come up with anything <laughs> that's actually compelling. There's some of these Navy videos that were released by the US Navy, that, but they're just kind of blurry, black and white, thermal camera things of things that really don't do anything amazing. They're just distant planes and things like that, Not, nothing particularly amazing. What's good evidence for the individuals is usually the stories that people tell. And then I, unfortunately, you can't really do much scientific analysis of stories or really verify that they actually happened. Like the story you said, car stopping on the freeway, that comes from like old stories from back in the 50s and the 60s, like the uh, some classic abduction cases, Barney and Betty Hill. They had something like that happen to them, and that, that becomes the genesis of other stories. And uh, apparently, every and time they were into an archetype, it, their story changed and it got more elaborate and it got more elaborate and it just, it kept evolving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it. people recover memories as well. They get hypnotized and they recover memories, which probably means that the memories are being created. They don't actually being recovered at all. They just, for whatever reason, they come up with a story and it, it resembles other stories. Now, you could argue that it's resembling other stories because the same aliens are abducting people or perhaps it's just they've heard the stories. These UFO stories, they it kind of reminds me of the classic Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces thing, the hero cycle. It's this classic mm -hmm. which usually starts with a individual being plucked from obscurity and sent on a mission and then becoming the hero. And if you look at Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that story is about, it's about ordinary people being called by this extraordinary force to do amazing things. And the, the main character, played by Richard Dreyfuss, yeah. he's the guy who's making mountains of, of mashed potatoes yeah. and giant like portals of Dell's Tower. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then eventually, he's the one who gets chosen to be the person who accompanies the aliens on their ship. He becomes the hero, he becomes the messenger for all humanity. Yeah. So that idea of being elevated from your humdrum existence into you know, to walk amongst the gods is very appealing to people. Yes, indeed. I loved that movie. In fact, I recently, I've downloaded it again and I'm going to watch it one of these days very soon. Yeah. It was a fantastic film of its, of its time and it's definitely also very compelling, but, but yeah, it's a absolutely classic. The Steven Spielberg, well, Steven Spielberg was it, right? Yeah. And of yes. course, E.T., which was also one of my favorite movies as a child, probably still is. <laughs> and The Flight of the Navigator, yeah. yet another one of those absolutely fantastic movies that I've watched time and again. But these, but the new UFO stories, which have come out more recently, the FLIR cam that was released by the US Navy, all these documents that have been released by the US government. What do you make of those? Like, have those been compelling at all? What was in them? Well, I think they show that pilots see things that they can't identify. And this is something that, in a way, you'd expect to happen. At some point, pilots are going to see things that they can't identify. You know, the real interesting thing would be is if 
you could demonstrate that unambiguously that pilots saw something performing maneuvers that were impossible. Now, mm -hmm. we have accounts of pilots saying that they saw these things, but can we demonstrate that this actually happened with multiple sensor data? Is there actually a video from, say, two cameras of the same thing or a video plus radar? People kind of assume that that exists, but we, the public, don't have any access to that information. The government and the military essentially have said that there's no evidence of aliens. And there's no real strong evidence that there's anything particularly amazing going on. And we have a lots of we have a combination of factors here. There's a big issue is secrecy. A lot of UFOs are just clutter in the airspace, but some of those UFOs may be foreign adversaries. They may be uh, countries like like China and Russia, like the United States, kind of older and newer adversaries that are just testing our, our airspace using new technology like drones. Mm. And there's been incidents where drones have actually been flying around US Navy vessels. So yeah. because there's these real national security concerns to do with UFOs, which are the drones, when you first see them, they're not identifiable, so they're a UFO. We don't hear very much from the military about it, and that makes people think they're covering something up. But they're probably just being careful about what information gets leaked out to the Chinese, which are probably the ones who are more responsible for the more recent sightings. And so because the military doesn't talk about it, it leaves the door open for speculation. And we get these videos released by the Navy and people think, oh, these are amazing videos. They're showing UFOs. And yeah, they are, but they're not showing anything particularly amazing. Like the gimbal video, it looks like it's a rotating flying saucer. I've done a bunch of analysis on that one. And it seems like it's just essentially, it's a thermal camera. And it looks like it's looking at the tailpipe of a jet engine. Like if I say this, this flashlight here, yeah, if this was like a jet engine, you can imagine like stuff coming out of here. And when you switch it on, like it's on now, you, you can't really see very much because there's nothing going on. You can't really see the heat of the engine. But if it turns towards the camera, then it kind of gets brighter. And at some point, you get this oval shape around the flashlight itself, which obscures the flashlight. And it's it can actually get you know, pretty bright and obscure everything else as well. And I think that's what's going on in the gimbal video. It's you know, We're looking up the tailpipe of this jet, and when it's pointing towards the camera, it, you get this bright, bright glare. And the way the camera is mounted, when it tracks from left to right, it actually has to rotate because it's mounted on this gimbal in a long direction, which just the, the configuration of the gimbal means it, it has to do this rotation at some point. It can't just go like this because it would the angle wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. I have long explanations of this on, in my various videos. And if you do the math on that, the rotation of the camera exactly matches the rotation of the of the object in the video. So it seems like it's just a camera artifact. Uh, so it's it, once once you've got past that, it's just it's, it's just a mysterious craft. It's just an airplane of some sort doing something, but not nothing interesting. The the mystery kind of falls away there. It's like the uh, once you investigate these things, initially they sound amazing. They talk about another thing, like the New York Times article 2017 that kind of started this whole thing, talked about the gimbal video. And the title of the actual article in the New York Times was Glowing Auras and Black Money. And the black money was about secret projects, but the glowing auras was about the glow around, a different glow, so like a, a cold glow around this gimbal video. But that's just... A camera function is this thing called an unsharp mask, which increases the contrast between light and dark. And it's something the pilot can switch on and off in the cockpit. And they should have known that. <laughs> they should have done the research and figured that out. If not like the journalists, but certainly there's people supplying them with that video. But they didn't. And uh, you get all these people making amazing claims. It's like, why does this have this cold aura around it? It can only be some kind of a space warp, which is warping the fabric of space and time itself and making hot look cold. And it's just it's just wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. That that explanation is far more interesting than it's an unsharp mask that you can toggle with a button in the cockpit. Yeah, it's saying it's a warp bubble. That's a lot more fun. A lot more fun than, than an image filter. So Absolutely. that's the one that sticks. But the and this the flare cam footage, the gimbal cam footage, that reminds me a lot of this the the Chilean UFO that I have also yeah. seen recently, which has which is these two orbs which are going through a which are kind of also kind of spotted. I think this is an infrared camera as well. 
which just looks like two jet engine exhausts to me. Yeah, it's actually it's actually four jet engine exhausts, which is a, another thing that confuses people. It's the plane that we're looking at in that case. You know, it turns out to be a plane. You know, they thought it was a UFO for several years, but it's just a plane, which was verified by downloading the radar tracks and then recreating it in three dimensions and then figuring out where the helicopter was, where we have the exact location of that helicopter that's videoing it, pointing the camera in that direction, dropping in the radar track of the plane, bam, there it appears right in the middle, exactly where that object is. So we know for sure is just a plane. Oh. It's a bit confusing what you're looking at, though, because you've got these what look like two orbs. But the plane is an Airbus A340, which oh. is a four-engine plane, two on each wing. So you've got a group of two and then another group of two. And there are actually points in the video where you can see the individual engines. It's a little fiddly. You see it when there's what's called a saccade where the camera moves rapidly and it, you see the streaks. You can only see three of the engines, but you can see it's individual engines. Let's see I can see, see if I can demonstrate this. I've got like, another flashlight here. So if I put like, like two flashlights and bring them together, yeah, it just looks like one. But yeah. there's actually two. Yeah. Yeah, so you get these two blobs, and they're even closer together than that, I think. You know, when it's, when it's quite close together, like, it ends up being like that or something. I mean, it's actually two separate things. Nice. And then the other thing that confuses people was you know, my specialty, which is contrail. At one point in the video, you see what looks like dark matter being sprayed out of, of the back. And because we know in the video that dark is hot, yeah, it looks like boiling liquid or something is being sprayed out of the back of the plane and that really confused people for some reason well understandably i guess because it's like why is it hot but if you stop focusing on the middle of the picture and you look around it you'll see there are clouds in the image and some of the clouds are black they show up as black against the sky and this isn't because the clouds are hot it's because the sky itself is very cold and uh, now you when you think of the sky there's nothing actually there. I mean, it's just air. If you keep going, it's space. So when you point your thermal camera up into the sky, especially if I put a bit of an angle, you're essentially kind of looking out into the cold of space. I mean, not exactly because there's a bit of radiation scattered by the atmosphere as well, but you're not seeing any heat coming off the sky. So it appears to the thermal camera to be really cold. So if you take like a piece of ice, like a chunk of ice from your freezer mm. and you're hold it up against the sky it will look dark it will, against the sky it will look cold it will look like it no, sorry, it'll look warm it'll look like it is warmer than the sky because it is the sky registers about minus 60 or something like that and this ice is only about minus 10 or something oh, so wow. I you, was wondering about exactly when that. you see yeah when you see something that appears warm against the sky it doesn't mean it's warm it just means it's warmer than the sky and since the sky is minus 60 it could be looking at a contrail at minus 40 Wow. Okay. That explains a lot. Which is what is actually happening here. <laughs> That's very interesting. And what about the uh, the Tic Tac UFO? What, because, and there've been lots of pilots who've kind of spoken yeah. about this at length. I've watched a couple of these interviews where they've gone off and they said that there have been multiple encounters over several days on the ship. Everybody, like there's several people who saw it. And then they were flying and they saw it kind of zigzagging around in weird motions, like in very unusual tracks, you could say, flight yeah, path. Yeah, yeah. See. Well, so, the, the explanation. The, the TTAC UFO is a number of different events that happened to the USS Nimitz strike group. And the USS Nimitz is an aircraft carrier. And there was, there was another ship called the Princeton, which was there, which was a, I'm not sure what they call it, like a cruiser or a battleship or something like that. Mm. Uh, it's a slightly smaller ship and that has a radar on it. But the people on the ships were seeing these radar returns and they said it looks like groups of five things just moving down the screen from north to south pretty slowly, about 100 knots, 115 miles per hour. And they weren't doing anything special. And for a while, they just kind of ignored them. They didn't know what they were exactly. And then they, the radar operator persuaded the captain that they needed to go investigate them. So after a few days of watching these things do nothing at all other than drift from north to south, they decided to send the plane out there. So they send this group of two planes, Commander David Fravor mm -hmm. in one with his backseater, and then Alex Dietrich in the other one. She was a junior pilot at the time, like doing training, like following David Fravor around, basically. 
And they go over and they try to find this thing. When they arrive at the designated point, the thing's not there. They were told there's an object at 20,000 feet. They get there and there's nothing there. But then they fly around a little bit and look down. And then they see something far below them, like four miles. They're at 20,000 feet. They're looking down at the ocean level. That's like four miles straight down. So they see a, a tiny little white speck. Probably like smaller than what my little headphone thing will look like here. Let's see. I actually have a, a Tic Tac over oh, there. there a lot go. smaller than that one. Wait, yeah, a lot smaller than that one. A tiny little thing. But they see something that they say looks like this. Looks like a, a, a Tic Tac shape. Yeah. But it's four miles away down at the surface of the ocean. So they're looking at a tiny little white dot. They can't really tell what it is. One pilot stays up high. Alex Dietrich, David Fravor goes down. He goes down and he says he sees the object move up to meet him. So they're, they're now like at 12,000 feet or something like that. Mm -hmm. He thinks he's a couple of miles over here. He starts like circling around and it starts circling around the other way. So going around in circles. Oh, so it seems to him. And then he decides to cut across. So he starts to fly across and then it just zoop, zips away, disappears faster than the eye can see from his account. Now, I don't know exactly what happened there, but one theory is that what he described is kind of very curious in that it's something that's mirroring him exactly. It's doing the exact opposite of what he is doing. Now, yeah. it could be something that's like advanced AI that's reading his mind and knowing exactly what he's going to do. Or it could be essentially an optical illusion. Like if, if the object isn't on the other side of the circle, if there's an object over here in the middle of the circle and you fly around that object, it visually looks exactly the same as an object on the other side of the circle circling around. And if there's something here that's halfway between you and the ocean, and you're looking down at it, and then you come down, this thing, even though it's not moving, there's something in the middle, imagine my nose is the thing here. Yeah. It's, it stays in the same position, but it looks like it's going in the exact opposite direction to you. And then the same thing again, when you fly around that thing, it's going to look like it's also flying. And then when you fly towards it, there's an even more dramatic illusion because you think it's over here. Then you fly over here. It looks like it's accelerating really rapidly. And then all of a sudden, it zips past you at a really high rate of speed. And then it disappears because you don't know exactly where it is in space. So it could all have been some kind of optical illusion from something like a balloon or perhaps some kind of advanced Navy drone or like a test missile or something that really wasn't doing very much in terms of zipping around all over the place. It was just all a big optical illusion. But it was nearly 20 years ago now. We're not going to figure out what it actually was. That's just a possible theory that might explain it. So that is, in effect, a UAP. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an unidentified aerial phenomena. Yeah. Except it's, it, it, yeah. It's, and then like there's video. And mm. people get, get that confused as well. They think that's from the same incident. It's actually from a different plane an hour later in a different location. I saw something off in the distance and recorded it on video for a short period of time. And then because they were like fiddling around with the camera too much, they eventually lost the lock on it and it drifted off screen. And then they, I guess they had better things to do and they didn't follow it. So it's, these are all separate incidents. It's not like one thing that happened. It's a bunch of things that kind of happened in sequence. And then people think, well, so many things happened. It can't be a coincidence. It must be, it must be aliens. But yeah, you know, sometimes coincidences happen. Maybe because they had these strange radar returns, they got really excited about the idea of finding a UFO, and then they were a bit over-enthusiastic in interpreting what they saw. And then because of that, everyone got really excited, and then they started pointing the camera at anything they saw in the sky and saying, that's a UFO. We don't, it's not really very good evidence. Yeah, and, and on top of that, like there's this amazing show, which I watched a couple of episodes of, called Brain Games. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Have you heard of it? I've not seen it, but I think I know what it is. Yeah, I think it was on Hotstar in this country, but it, it was fascinating. It showed you exactly how the brain works. And I think the very first episode was where they enacted a theft. They first had, there was a, some sort of a magician or a, some sort of a, some sort of event was happening in the middle of a park. People crowded around it. Suddenly somebody just ran out and they had an actor 
who was running away from the scene and another person running after him saying he just stole my wallet and then they went to individual people and they asked each one what had happened and each one had a slightly different story as well as over time they started embellishing their story with more details things they hadn't necessarily seen adding more details like this was a this kind of looking guy he had this kind of a beard he was wearing a red sweater or something of that sort and it just like it demonstrates to you how extremely fallible our memories are we cannot rely on our eyes and our brains to keep things accurate over a period of time not even immediately like even if they're asked immediately about some incident that is happening to them right then they just happened to them like a couple of minutes before even then there will be a, mm -hmm. so many people who will just get certain details completely wrong there have been so many of these videos which have also popped up from time to time where it says that count how many times they've thrown the ball in the two people throwing balls at each other and counting the num number of times they've thrown that but there's like and at the end of the video said did you see the panda <laughs> and there was apparently a panda that leisurely walks across the screen at some point of time but you're not just you're just not paying attention yeah so the yeah. uh so attention the blindness yeah it's just it's it's we are extremely fallible creatures and we should all be kind of aware of that when we're when we're looking at these things and especially with confirmation bias when we see when we watch these alien shows and just they're just asking what if and they're talking about hearsay like for example there was one of these episodes i think it was ancient aliens where they talk about this this cave in vietnam where you kind of go deep underground where some of the ceilings of the caves have fallen in and seeds and other plant life have fallen in and they've they're growing under whatever sunlight that they can get and they have i mean it's one of the biggest caves in the world apparently and apparently the locals are saying that there are humanoid lizard like beings wandering around in there and they come out of the cave every now and then but how reliable is that evidence it just makes oh, you can set up a trail camera <laughs> if exactly. that was happening. It's, yeah, it's, that's again like one of those things like I was talking about earlier is that the eyewitness testimony doesn't correlate with the camera testimony. And yeah. If we had, if there were things happening on a regular basis, you'd be able to get it on camera. Exactly. And whether it's like lizard beings in a cave or people being abducted or UFOs appearing on the regular then it's something that we'd be able to analyze. We'd be able to get it on camera. We'd be able to figure out what's actually going on. But instead, it's all curiously elusive. It's stuff that doesn't want to be uh, recorded on camera, which you know, doesn't make any sense because if people can see it, then they can record it with their cameras. And light is light. If light is going in your eyes, light can go in the camera. But there's this big disconnect, which I think is a clue. I think it's an indication that what people are seeing or think they are seeing or claim they are seeing isn't actually as they recall it, isn't actually as they perceive it. It's actually something else is going on and it's probably not, not aliens and not lizard people. Yeah. And of course, the hollow earth is yet another thing. It's like people don't like, I don't know. I don't understand how there are so many conflicting ideas of the our planet that it's either a hollow earth or it's a shrinking earth or it's an expanding earth or it's a flat earth. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many different stories. Well, uh, I mean, if you're rejecting mainstream science, then I guess you just go with whatever sounds like it's best to you. you know, the flat earth people, it's more really about a rejection of the globe earth than it is about thinking the earth is a particular shape. They don't really have any science at all to back it up. I mean, they say they do, like, but you know, they really don't. And really all they're doing is saying, you can't trust the government, you can't trust scientists, therefore the Earth might not be a ball. Yeah. And the couple of times that they have managed to prove themselves wrong, they have completely ignored it. <laughs> yeah, so that's how it works. I mean, <laughs> it's still, it looks flat, so let's go with that. Yeah, there's... Absolutely no explanation of how gravity works because they are denying that gravity even exists, and uh, yes. that it's we are accelerating it's up. A, it's frustrating. 
but with what? Yeah, there's two kind of flat earth theories. One is the this constant acceleration, which doesn't make sense. I mean, this thing may as well just say it's magic gravity. It's, it makes yeah. no difference. Yeah, <laughs> or it's buoyancy, which yeah. is an interesting thing because buoyancy relies upon gravity to work. It's one of the Thank fundamental you. reasons why things are buoyant is that gravity is pulling the liquid down and how you have a density gradient and things like a pressure gradient. But yeah, it's it's almost like science via linguistics. It's using words to do science. Like you say, yeah. like it's not gravity, it's buoyancy because buoyancy does this and balloons float, they don't fall to the ground and they do that because of buoyancy. So yeah. buoyancy must explain all things to do with things falling and rising, which sounds like it makes sense if you don't know what you're talking about. Because yeah, you can point to examples. You can say some things float in liquid and yeah. things like sink. So it's not the gravity pulling heavy things down. It's that heavier things are less buoyant. And so they go towards the down direction for some reason. But it's it doesn't make any sense from a scientific point of view, but you can make it sound like it makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big follower of Simon Dan on YouTube, and he's got some fantastic yeah. videos debunking these claims of flat earthers, which is, well, I'm glad they're doing it. Of course, it doesn't change anything really, but of course, it all helps us think a little bit more clearly about what exactly is going on on our planet. Okay, now let me get into some questions that I've received from, from viewers and friends. And let's see what we've managed to get. One question is, Drake's equation versus Fermi's paradox, which is, I mean, kind of self-evident. Like if we have the high, yeah. very high probability of, I mean, basically for people who don't know, the Drake equation is essentially the equation which kind of calculates the likelihood of li intelligent life in the universe where you basically, it's a factor of how many stars there are in the universe or at least in the galaxy. We can even do it for just the galaxy. How many of those stars have planets around them? How many of those planets are habitable? How many of those planets, what fraction of those planets would have the likelihood of having intelligent life and how, what fraction of those life forms would be able to develop far enough to have space flight or be able to communicate interstellar. And Fermi's paradox is if there are so many out there, so many intelligent civilizations out there, the likelihood of that is pretty high. Why haven't we heard yeah. from them yet? So what do you think about that? Well, I think there's a couple of points there. I mean, Drake's equation is a way of calculating a probability based on assumptions. Yeah, a lot of assumptions. So you basically you can plug in some numbers into each of these positions in Drake's equation, then you multiply them all together, and it gives you the fraction of stars which will have have intelligent life on them. Yeah, I'm not sure if it includes a term for having intelligent life on now. Do you remember if it does that? Maybe because there's another aspect of right. of this called the Great Filter, which is yeah. kind of like a Drake's equation in reverse in a way. It's like what factors civilization, and there's lots of things. One of them is asteroid impacts. You, if you have the, if you look at the moon, it's got lots of big holes in it because it's constantly being hit by asteroids, and the Earth has also has lots of big holes in it, but there are lots of they're covered by natural processes and whatnot because there's lots more going on the earth. Now, there's a bit less impact because things burn up in the atmosphere, but still big enough asteroids hit the moon, big enough asteroids hit the earth and they wipe everything out and civilization dies. And this probably happens fairly often. We get big impacts probably every hundred thousand years or so. So is civilization likely to persist long enough on, on things? I mean, that's a solvable problem. We can get around asteroids, but there's lots of other reasons why civilizations might not last very long. And perhaps there's some aspect of physics that they always end up discovering and that creates a little <laughs> black hole wherever they exist and they disappear in a poof. Perhaps that's just something that always happens with science because it's, they naturally have to press this, what's this button do? And then they have to press <laughs> that button and that's the end of civilization, but button. Uh, so we, there's so many un, unknowns about that. Yeah, you know, what we do know about the universe is that we can't currently detect any sounds of life in it. Oh, uh, we've just started. No, as far as yeah, we we have just started. But so as far as we know, 
as far as we know, the, there's no detectable signs of life. No one's like reaching out to us. No one's trying to do anything, which is, I guess, the other aspect of it. Fermi's paradox is, where is everyone? If the universe has life, why aren't they here? Mm. And yeah, that's it's only a paradox if there is life. It's not really a paradox if we are the only intelligent life in this galaxy or one of the very few intelligent life forms in this galaxy and no one else has managed to get very far. Unfortunately, the what I think is likely is that life isn't that common in the universe, in in the galaxy. Maybe it's just the maybe the Drake equation works out to being approximately one life form per galaxy every billion years or something like the developed civilization or every even every million years and and then it it, it peters out but we could be the first we could just happen to be the first life that has arisen in this galaxy it's it's just because life does arise all the time it doesn't mean that whoever is first will have other civilizations obviously it's false on the face of it that it has to be first exactly there's no reason why it's not us Ah, that's true. Uh, so I really, I don't really see them as being equations and hypotheses, Drake's equation versus the Fermi paradox. There's Drake's equation, and then there's the Fermi observation. There's Drake's guess at how much life there is in the universe, and then there's Fermi's evidence, which is that we haven't seen any yet, neither of which are particularly information-rich, because we can't really see a lot of the galaxy in terms of like looking at what's going on in individual stars. And we can't, certainly can't see what's going on in stars in other galaxies. And the fact that no one's visited us yet might not actually mean very much. I would love to have Neil deGrasse Tyson at some point of time to kind of explain this yeah. better back of the envelope calculations. But of course, stars are extremely <laughs> far from each other. Like we, It takes a long time to travel. Yeah. We can't travel very close to the speed of light. And that still takes an incredible amount of time. It's yeah, got- I think of those two things, Fermi, the Fermi equation and Drake's paradox. I'd go more with the, the Drake equation and Fermi paradox. I'd go more with the Fermi paradox as an observation. The fact that, that we can't detect life, I think it's a pretty strong indication that there isn't life in the galaxy. I think if there was life, it would have spread. The problem is, like, even in that, it's just based on assumptions. And there's various different ways of spinning the Drake equation. And there's various different ways of spinning the uh, the Fermi paradox, the zoo hypothesis, and the great filter, which means that civilizations don't last very long. Mm. But I, I think that you, know, you got to think of von Neumann probes, self-replicating machines that travel yeah. from star to star. I think, why hasn't something like that colonized the entire galaxy? It's Pretty like weird. something that would eventually happen. Exactly, because that's a much more plausible way of traversing the universe without actually going out by yeah. yourselves. You have robots do that for you. That's what we do with all the planets in our solar system. We always send robots before yeah. we send ourselves. So there's no reason why some, I would probably think, not very clever alien life form would hop onto a spaceship and say, oh, let's go explore like we did in Star Trek. Yeah. It's so, it's so hypothetical, though, everything. There's also, the, like, the in the great filter, there's a variety of things that, like, one is that artificial reality, like, simulated virtual reality is so much better than real reality when you get to a certain <laughs> level. But already, we see everybody spending lots of time online, lots of time playing games in, in, in regular games and VR games. What about when games get to be, like, in, in Ready Player One, like, so good? that your life in virtual reality is a thousand times better than your life in real reality, what would be the motivation to leave your solar system? Your only motivation would be to improve your computers, get a better motherboard, encase your sun in a Dyson sphere so you can capture all the energy, so you can run these amazing simulations and have these wonderful lives inside this virtual reality that you would be not be able to have. In the real world, like why would you spend years on a spaceship traveling to a hunk of rock somewhere else (laughs) when you could be the master wizard in a never-ending universe in virtual reality? So that's one one of the great filter arguments is that games are so much more fun than reality. That's going to happen. And then there's like other ones like the gray goo argument, nanotechnology, self-replicating machines. Like you get to a certain stage, and you accidentally you get to the stage where things you become self-replicating at a molecular level and everything turns to bush. Oof. I would, I've actually, I, I have contemplated that too. And I think in the new version of, what is that remake with Keanu Reeves? 
that science fiction movie. Oh, well, the name slipping. But there, there was a remake of one of these really amazing, one of the first, one of the oldest, older science fiction movies, where where that spacecraft lands in New York City and the robot with the laser eyes kind of sits, mm. just walks out, and this other guy wanders off and says, "We are just trying to save you from yourselves." And uh, the Klaatu Barada Nikto thing. Yeah, uh, that's okay, what's that called now? <laughs> what is that one called? It's like uh, Google it, Google uh, it. <laughs> yes, the day the Earth stood still. The day the Earth stood. Yeah, there's a two. There's a 2008 remake. Yeah, with so Keanu Reeves. That movie, that remake. They were actually they had released these nanobots that were kind of leveling the Eiffel Tower and all the uh, big sightseeing places around the world, which was, which, I mean, of course they were doing that for a totally different reason, but it, it just brought back that memory. But yeah, the, I, the gray goo thing is phenomenal. Plus, of course, as Carl Sagan had hypothesized, maybe they just found nuclear energy and then blew themselves to kingdom come. Yep. Something we yeah. might still. Uh, this That's an interesting, I had a discussion on that recently and it's almost like there's a an existential threat to humanity from physics research and biological research, you know, because you know, biologists could discover some kind of superbug that kills everybody. Mm. Physicists could also discover some kind of subatomic event or something that, when triggered, creates a, a massive explosion and destroys everything, creates some kind of self-replicating machine. And this person was suggesting that we 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 have installed surveillance on all of our scientists, so and have AI watching them just in case they're about to get close to something like that. And then they have to wear exploding collars or something and they blow their heads off <laughs> if they're about to discover some kind of gray goo device. It didn't seem like a very workable solution. It's an interesting thing that maybe the science could discover something terrible and and that could get released. So, yeah, we had the coronavirus, but what, oh, yeah. what if you get a much more higher case fatality rate just because somebody is tinkering with it using CRISPR device at, at home? Yeah. Oh, we, when CRISPR gets into your bedroom, we're all in trouble. <laughs> but okay, so back on the thing, I wanted to ask you about Operation High Jump. Now, I watched a very old video which had been made about this with, and there's this Admiral Bird who is proclaimed to have lost control of his aircraft, which are then flying by itself and discovered in the middle of Antarctica some mm -hmm. green region with rivers and lakes and green mountains and apparently some sort of a crystal city. Has that from his personal diary or something of that sort? Have you heard about that one? Yeah, no, it's one of these old stories, essentially. But you know, the thing is, we fly planes over Antarctica now and it's not there. So, I mean, what happened? You can, if you wanted to, if you were rich enough, you could charter a plane and fly it over Antarctica for, you know, like something like half a million dollars or something like that. Yeah, but there's nothing there. The, the yeah, we, we see satellite videos of it, satellite photos. And yeah, it's an interesting story, the Admiral Bird thing. I mean, it's the whole Hollow Earth thing as well. Like they, right. they say that was the entrance to the Hollow Earth and maybe it's been closed up or something. But it's, I don't know, it's essentially just a tall tale, which I don't really put any stock in because there's no supporting evidence. Yeah. And people, for some reason, are saying, keep saying that Antarctica is off limits to everyone. Is that's that... I mean, It's not off limits at all. But there are international treaties where you can't build things on it. But tourists go there all the time. And yeah, there's no reason why, if you have the money, you can't just fly over it. There's limitations to the types of plane that you can fly over. Like you can't, I think you have to either have a four engine plane or you have to have a whole bunch of safety devices on the plane, like parachutes and things like that, and radio beacons. See, there's this certification that you got to have. But there's nothing stopping you from doing that. You can just charter an A340, which is a four engine plane and fly over. Boom, it's not even very far. You go from Sydney to Santiago. It's a perfectly doable flight. No one does fly over Antarctica just simply because the routes don't line up. If you actually go from, I think, from Sydney to Santiago, you miss Antarctica by a while. If you were to go from Perth to Santiago, that would actually fly over the South Pole. Perth is on the other end of Australia. Like, you know, 
13 ah, hundred miles further away. But the actual routes between the southern cities don't actually go over the South Pole, not because they're avoiding it, just because they don't line up. You can get a globe and draw lines. Do we have a globe? I have a globe. Yeah. Here's Antarctica and the bottom. Let's see. So if you're going from Australia here to... What is this? This is Africa. So if you're going to Johannesburg, you're going from Australia over to Johannesburg and you miss Antarctica. If you're going to South America, let's say, I think from here, you still miss... Where is the... Oh, wait, you, you go over this way, I think. I can, yeah, it's difficult to see because I'm looking in the mirror reflection here. <laughs> Let me just look at it this way. So Santiago to, all right, yeah, so it's over this way, which is, again, you know, going from Santiago. This is, yeah, this is Australia. This is, it was backwards when I was looking at it. So this is where all the cities are in Australia. Yeah. And so you go to South America, you miss it because mm. uh, you're going over there. But if you set up from the other end, and like in, and this is where Perth is, yeah. and you're going over to South America, you will actually go straight over. The South Pole, but there are no, there are no direct flights <laughs> there because not that many people live in Perth, and that's all there is to it. And it's not any big conspiracy. It's just the Whoever way the cities line there. up. Whoever does live there probably might not need to go to Santiago anytime soon. I, I know. I mean, uh, how much call cool <laughs> is there for that? So you, you fly to Melbourne, and then you fly to well Sydney, and you, then you fly to Santiago. Well, we can. I hope I can give it a shot at some point of time. It's not like I have anything to prove, though. But uh, <laughs> there was, <laughs> there's, there was a lot of. Uh, there's also been a lot of talk about Operation Paperclip. So, from what I understand, yeah. this is, and the U.S. hired a lot of Nazi scientists to come over to the American side. But I, uh, yeah. I what could you fill me in on how people connect these operations? to UFOs and aliens? Because apparently there was there's some, something to do with Nazis making a deal with aliens, or there were some alien operations, or something of that sort. Well, there's lots of legends about, about Nazis. You know, Germany, during towards the end of the world, world War II, was actually technologically one of the most advanced nations in the Earth. The only thing they didn't have was the atomic bomb. They had the V2 rocket which was a very powerful weapon. It was this sort of semi-autonomously guided rocket with its nice little inertial guidance systems it was able to be launched from Europe and come down in London. And it was a very effective weapon. And it was just kind of economics and the fact that the war was almost lost at that point anyway that didn't that meant it, it wasn't, didn't make much of a difference to the outcome of the war. But the V-2 rocket was then used basically by the Americans. They took the people who were on the V2 rocket program over to America and used the expertise that they had to actually develop the US rocket program, which led eventually to the space program. So, And that's the Operation Paperclip. They brought people over. They weren't necessarily Nazi scientists. They were scientists who were employed by the Nazi regime. So they were just people who were essentially were living and working in Germany at that time and you know, hadn't left. So it, it doesn't mean that they are like evil Nazi scientists who experiment on babies and then go and build rockets for the United States. It's basically the rocket scientists from, from Germany who got brought over after the war to work in the United States. But then there's lots of legends to do with the Nazis. I mean, if you look at, like, say, the Indiana Jones movie, and you see this kind of mysticism that's associated with Nazis, like the Nazis were seeking out the Holy Grail and then the the Ark of the Covenant to try to win the war, and, and you do things like that. And it, there was stories about how the Nazis had flying saucer technology, mm. and that a part of that is based on reality because when you're developing planes. You look through the history of American aviation, you'll see some planes end up looking like flying saucers, this type of flying wing. And then some engineer gets the idea, well, let's make this flying wing be circular so it can go in different directions. And you end up getting something that's like a flying saucer. For some reason, it never really work out. It's not that practical of a design of a plane. But there are things that are attributed to Nazis. And then after the war, there were all these stories about where did the Nazis go? Because some of the Nazis did actually flee to other countries and they end up living in South America. And you get these, these, there's these myths about what's actually going on there. Like, where did they end up? There's the, oh, I don't know, there's a movie, I think it's called The Boys. 
Boys of which Bruce is essentially Hill or something of that sort. Yeah, it's set in South America, but it's essentially a Nazi mythology thing about them trying to create clones of Hitler. Yeah, uh, in in South America, but yeah, it's just kind of a, almost like a trope. Just a, a a literary device that's grown up over the years, just because Nazis were such a significant part of the history of the 20th century, is that their effects reverberate. There's really no good evidence of anything like them contacting aliens. It's just a bunch of leg- legends and stories, essentially. So there's no actual no records of any sort, or I mean, claims have been made, stories have been told, but nothing. More than that, when it comes to aliens or anything of that sort, that you've been Nazis, no, not that I know of. I'm sure, like, if you ask someone who's more interested in in, in that type of thing, you will find things. Yeah, there's this like buried Nazi gold and uh, the bases in Antarctica, and but they're all just stories. They're not nothing actually really came of them. So it's one of the the, the more esoteric aspects of ufology, I think. Ah, interesting. And of course, Joe Rogan is more than happy to propagate any ideas that get thrown at him. So <laughs> a lot of Joe Rogan stuff is based on this, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's because it's such a kind of a well-developed but old set of mythology. It was written in, in the 60s and the 70s that it becomes part of almost like an accepted background because it's just stuff that you can't check for yourself. It's in these old books that were written like 50, 60 years ago, and you can't really do anything with it. So it's easy for people to like glom onto it and think there's something there because most investigators don't really care about it because it's so ridiculous. So no one takes the time to debunk it in the same way they take the time to debunk the moon landing hoaxes. Yeah, exactly. And I've I encountered one one video that a friend sent over with with Joe Rogan interviewing this guy called Bob Lazaro. Bob Lazar, yes. Lazar, sorry, yeah. And his work in Area 51, where he encountered a whole bunch of strange ships which had anti-gravity mechanisms and stuff like that that he yeah. that he noticed. And he described it with quite a bit of detail. But from what I heard, this was all back in the 90s, one way or the other. But I was so what's up with Bob Lazar? He, is he how reliable is? I mean, I don't doubt well, that. Well, he's, he's basically, most people consider him to have made these things up. I, mean, I know Joe Rogan doesn't, which means obviously now millions of other people don't either. Like yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people. But he's his story doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. And his background is very shady. Like mm-hmm. he's got some criminal convictions in his past. Like he was arrested for like running a brothel and installing hidden cameras in this brothel and yeah. just things like that make it seem like a less than reputable character and not just it's not just an attack on his personality hmm. that means that he wouldn't be able to get security clearance because he has this very dubious background this these criminal allegations he wouldn't be the type of person who would get high security clearance and he wasn't really he didn't really have any evidence to show that he was an actual physicist he doesn't have records from the schools that he says he went to the universities that he says he went to. So I think the most likely thing is that he's pretty much just making everything up. Mm-hmm. And his it never actually happened. He didn't actually see the, his craft. Obviously, there's no physical evidence. All we have is his word and the fact that he you know, worked in the area. He worked at the, the Groom, I think, the was it maybe Groom Lake, but it, one of the bases there. He did actually work there, but his job title was, I think, photo processor or something like that. He worked in the developing films. You know, not actually analyzing flying saucers. Oh, and so what exactly happened? I mean, what is Area 51? It's a place in Nevada where the military basically tests advanced technology. So if you have a secret plane, like say the U-2, like the, the spy plane or the SR-71 Blackbird, or uh, more recent advanced planes like the B-2 bomber or the the stealth fighters and even like the F-35, like any new technology has to be tested somewhere. So they need a secure base in which to test it that's away from people. So the Nevada desert is a very good location to do that. And Mm. it's just a very high security base. And so mythology arises around it because it's secret. And so you don't know what's going on in there. And so people start speculating and there's no way of countering the speculation because we don't know what actually happened. So the speculation runs rampant. So, but I just wanted to quickly ask also, what exactly happened at Roswell? 
Like, was that mm. one of those experimental spa uh, spacecrafts, but or aircrafts or anything of that sort that were landed? What actually happened? Well, it kind of depends who you ask. The official story is that there was a project going on at the time called Project Mogul. Project Mogul involved essentially weather balloons, very large balloons that lifted up microphones and recording devices into the upper air that were intended to detect nuclear explosions. And so they wanted to detect if the Russians were doing some kind of covert nuclear explosion in the atmosphere and it's above ground, basically. Because if that happened, then they would hear it in mm -hmm. the atmosphere. You would get this very low frequency rumble. But this was a top secret thing. And so they didn't want the Russians to know that they were doing anything at all like this. So this was like the highest classification of secrecy. And then one of these balloons got a, a puncture and crashed on somebody's farm on Roswell. And then they discovered the wreckage of it. And you see the wreckage is like this silvery material. It's like kind of a mylar type thing. And some bits of balsa wood and some tape with symbols on it, which was like some kind of just regular old tape that they used to kind of wrap something with. And it seems like it was just this, this secret program to to study these explosions. But because they couldn't tell anybody about it, they kind of let the flying saucer story get out there. <laughs> and then it became a legend. And then we've got all these different people coming forward over the decades with different stories and different recollections. But of course, like as we talked about earlier, people's recollections of what happened can vary almost immediately. And certainly decades later, that can vary a lot more. So I, I tend to think that what happened was probably something like a military test balloon crashing, and then the, some confusion about what happened, and then these kind of a cover story of the UFOs, which was kind of retracted, I think, and then they went with something else, and then it uh, just kind of grew from there. And it was cleared up eventually because they released the real story, but then people say the government is lying. So there's no way of knowing. <laughs> now all we have <laughs> is a series of conflicting stories. Most likely one is probably the government one, but if you don't trust the government, the most likely one is some other guy's story. It's probably not going to get resolved. It's, and what a story it has become. Like I've, there's an entire, there's a mini series by uh, Steven Spielberg called Taken, which is a yeah. fantastic show. Like I've, I loved it when I watched it. I'm probably going to have to watch it again at some point. But yeah, I, I see it being recommended. It's, you can't, it's not available for streaming anywhere. You have to buy the DVD. Well, I had it downloaded. Oops, quite a okay. while back though, <laughs> back in the days when downloading but was I was doing all the downloading. <laughs> and I've kind of somehow managed to keep that in mm. the hard drives ever since. Yeah. So, without well, I think taken from what I've heard about it is very much reflecting the mythology of alien abductions. And so it's kind of reinforcing all these tropes about the things you described earlier with cars stopping on the road, lost time, lights from above, car shaking, things that you see in the movies and you see on the TV and that you'll see in, in people's memories because either they're remembering things they've seen on TV or they were the original people who first came up with the story. Absolutely. And one of these things which I was, I've li I listened to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast quite, quite a bit. And also, they, so they've mentioned a lot of hypnagogic experiences or hypnagogic experiences. And uh, Carl Sagan, in his book, the, no, was it, it wasn't the Dragons of Eden, it was... Some, Demon Haunted World? Demon Haunted World, yes. Where he talks about hypnagogic sleep and all the different experiences that come from it. And it is almost exactly like any alien abduction story out there where you are yeah. paralyzed, yeah. you seem to have sinister presences around you, you can't move, and yet things are being yeah. to you. And there have been this succubus legends as well, which is which came before the aliens, and different cultures have different explanations, both uh, superstitious, spiritual, and now even alien-related, which are yeah. all which all look very similar, <laughs> surprisingly similar, actually, which is Yeah, why. it is. It's amazing. Just it's this one phenomenon, this sleep paralysis, hypnagogic hallucinations that yes. you find in all of human history, but people attribute a more mystical explanation to it. It's, for the pe people experiencing it, it seems real. I was just at the Alien Con convention here in the States, and there were people talking about 
how they were paralyzed and then they saw this whatever dark shape or something in their room or somebody came in and stuck a probe up their nose, which is a story someone actually told. And he said, like, I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis because I was awake. But that's exactly what sleep paralysis is. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you feel like you're awake, but you can't move. But they said, look, well, it wasn't that because I wasn't asleep. But yeah, it's kind of like, what? It doesn't make any sense. See, it's people, if something seems real to a person, then they assume it is real. Like I've had hallucinations of giant spiders falling down from my ceiling when I'm going to sleep sometimes. It doesn't mean it's real, but it seems very real. I jump out of bed and turn the light on sometimes because it's it seems so incredibly real. And you can certainly see people being convinced that it is real. But it, what's so weird is that they reject the possibility that it was some kind of sleep and it was hallucination, even though what they describe is exactly the same as a sleep paralysis and hallucination. Exactly. It's fascinating though. But thank you so much. I won't take up any more of your time today. Hopefully we'll have you back for another episode sometime very soon. But yeah. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. This was incredibly enlightening. And seeing how the time has flown by, I was obviously, I had completely lost track of time. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's fun. fun. I always enjoy talking about these subjects. It's fascinating stuff and uh, more people should talk about them. It's fun. Absolutely. And for everybody watching, I hope you guys gained a new perspective on conspiracy theories and UFO sightings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if you believe in any of that sort of stuff. But this has definitely been incredibly fascinating. So thank you guys for watching. If you like this and please subscribe, where can people find you? Where can people find your content, your, your websites, your social media handles? Yeah, they, I'm Mick West pretty much everywhere. So you can find me there on, on Twitter and on YouTube, which is where I do most of my stuff, as well as my website, metabunk, metabunk.org. And you'll find lots of interesting things on all of those places. Wonderful. Everybody go check out Mick West's stuff, his website, metabunk, his social media. And let us know if you have any questions from this episode. And we'll definitely have him on for more because I have actually more questions that I wanted to cover, but we've completely run out of time this time. So please, guys, yeah. give us give this video a like. Hit that subscribe button if you want to see more amazing interviews like this on Rationable Interviews and for more content. Until next time, stay rationable. See ya.